Well, welcome everybody. Happy Earth Day or uh, Earth Week. Heck, I think we should do the whole month. My name is Pete Mara, and I'm the director of the Georgetown Environment Initiative and also a professor in biology in the McCourt uh, School of Public Policy. We have four events planned over the next week or so. Tonight is just the first. This series of events is what we hope will be many annual celebrations on and around Earth Day. We're calling it Voices on the Environment. It's an interdisciplinary linking of environmental topics and issues, but told through the lens of the humanities. It's around journalism, literary writing, theatrical performance, music, you name it. These events are hosted uh, by three organizations at Georgetown, uh, the Georgetown Environment Initiative, the GEI. It's an internationally recognized home for innovative education, groundbreaking research and transformative action on the environment and sustainability at Georgetown. The Georgetown Humanities Initiative, known for promoting interdisciplinary collaborations across departments for research, pedagogy, and public facing projects that demonstrate the enduring value of the humanities for the understanding of the human condition. And last but not least, the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, a joint initiative of the school, the Foreign Service and Georgetown College with a mission to harness the power of performance to humanize global politics. The lab also creates and presents high quality original productions, festivals, convenings, and innovative curricular initiatives that cast critical issues in a new light including numerous projects engaging on the environment. So tonight we're talking about truth, lies, and trust. Environmental science journalism in a misinformation era, a conversation. From vaccines causing autism to climate change denialism, we've all heard lots of different forms of alternative facts, fake news, and misinformation. These are not new ideas to most of us. And frankly, while this has reached a new crescendo over the last four years, this is also not a unique problem. Misinformation campaigns by the tobacco industry creating doubt between links between smoking and cancer, DDT and its impacts on birds, endocrine disruptors and doubt cast on the health effects of, of those go back a, a long ways. Many of these in misinformation campaigns have also had the unfortunate result of undermining the credibility of science more generally to the public. So part of the, the issue now is also that we're in this information age. The ability to find information now is so easy, which can be great if you're looking for a really quick recipe for feta tomato pasta, but it can also be quite dangerous if we're looking to confirm our fears on Google and Facebook. It's just, it's just not hard to do. People looking to confirm their existing biases can become quickly satisfied. You might say, well, let's look at the peer reviewed stamp of approval for a scientific paper. Yeah, sure that makes sense, but that doesn't always make it so, right? And with the growth of the preprint industry, this gets things out in the press prior to that peer review process. And the papers can have the appearance of being credible when they aren't at all. And we saw this being a problem, a huge problem in fact, as the pandemic descended upon us. So, this kind of leaves us in a tough spot. When do you know when something is fact or when something's fiction? And I bet 99% of what people think about a particular topic isn't something they've done the primary research on to demonstrate whether it's fact or fiction. Who, who has the time? So it's a dilemma. And there's another side of the problem. From a, from a science journalism perspective, how do the journalists themselves approach this problem? From the information they gather, Hopefully they're using the primary literature or primary sources, but how do they understand and trust the credibility of the information they present? They're putting their name on it. They potentially also bring their own implicit biases and their explicit biases to spin their stories. So where's the line? When they approach the story, are they trying to use the facts to convince people about the efficacy of wearing a face mask or that we all need to do our part to reduce the carbon footprint? Is that even their job? So tonight we brought together several veteran science and environmental journalists working in this area to discuss this topic. And there's a lot to unpack here. And thankfully, I'm not doing it with, the, uh, with these journalists. It's a, a, play, a, a friend and colleague, uh, David Malakoff, who I'd um, like to introduce to you, who will be moderating this session. He's a longtime science journalist, currently the deputy news editor at, at Science Magazine, focusing on policy, energy, and the environment. 
and David will introduce the panelists and moderate tonight's events. One quick note, we'd love to hear from the audience and get your questions. So uh, please do that through the Q&A function. David. Great, thanks, Pete, and thanks to Georgetown for sponsoring this. I think it's a, it's a great panel at a great time, a pretty pivotal moment in journalism and in the environment. Um, and we put this together, this panel, uh, specifically to provide a real diversity of views. Um, these are three very uh, distinguished journalists who uh, represent a really broad swath of the current American media. Uh, we have Jeff Burnside, who is now a documentary filmmaker, spent many decades working in television news in major markets around the country, won 10 Emmys for his work, has done numerous uh, important environmental stories that actually changed uh, life on the ground in cities around the country. Uh, Kendra Pierre-Louis uh, is currently at Gimlet, uh, running a podcast on climate change. Prior to that, she was at the New York Times, and prior to that, she was at Popular Science. Uh, you may follow her on Twitter. She, I can recommend her Twitter feed. It is extremely lively and interesting. Christina Larson uh, is now at the Associated Press. She is their global science and environment correspondent. Uh, I'm proud to say she's a former writer for us at Science Magazine and also for many other outlets. Uh, she's spent a significant chunk of time in China, uh, so has a substantial international experience and can see a lot of these issues from, from multiple perspectives. So welcome to all you panelists and thanks for being here. Thank you, David, good to see you. Yeah, um, I wanted to start because I think some of a lot of our audience may be students and some folks may be interested in getting into journalism. So I'd like to ask each of you just quickly to talk about sort of how did you end up doing what you do now? Um, and if you had one piece of advice to offer folks who are interested in your line of work, either something they should or should not do um, if they wanted to uh, move down the career path. Um, Jeff, do you want to start out? Sure. I'm one of those lucky ones. I, I knew since really second grade that I wanted to be a writer of some kind. In fifth, sixth grade, I knew I wanted to be a news reporter. So I, I never considered anything else. I feel fortunate to be in that position. I, I spent a good number of years you know, as a general assignment reporter in local television uh, in the trenches, and, and I kind of migrated toward investigative reporting for the last half of my career. And uh, over time, I, I found myself occasionally being drawn to more environmental stories. I think for two reasons. I, I, I felt there was a dearth of that coverage. And, you know, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, you're surrounded by mountains and ocean and beauty. And so I think it was part of my ethic as well. And, and so I, you know, in t TV news, you don't get the luxury of specializing as much as other platforms, although that's changing as well. And um, I, when I was working for NBC in Miami, I, I pushed an idea of what I think is the first local environmental news segment, and uh, it's called EcoWatch, and it was really well received, and the reporters loved doing it. And then I joined the Society of Environmental Journalists, and as we'd like to say, David, in SEJ, I, I knew I'd found my tribe when I joined SEJ. <laughs> And I became a board member for a long time and uh, twice elected president of, the, of that group. So, I, so I, I just came to know the environment as, as a really important issue. Uh, and I, I like to say they're the most important stories on the planet, the pun intended. And, um, and so I think that's, that's really how I got to be covering. Now, now I'm doing books and films, which is a different creature. And we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit later on. Yeah, one of the reasons we have this panel is very diversity styles of storytelling in audio, print, yeah. and uh, audio. So we may get into that a little bit. Uh, Christina, you want to talk about how you've ended up where, what, doing what you do? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, uh, I studied actually um, geology and English in college. So I guess I sort of split the difference. Was Unlike Jeff, did not know exactly what I wanted to do from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I came, my first job was in a little magazine called the Washington Monthly in Washington. And I was gravitating toward environment stories, I think because it allowed me to combine history and politics and landscape. It just felt like more than other topics that they covered, just very interdisciplinary and very interesting. Um, and then um, in, that was, a, that was like the mid 2000s. And then in 2000, and, oops, sorry. 
Sam. Um, and then just before, um, just before the 2008 financial crash, the Washington Monthly had a problem with one of its investors because of California real estate crashed before other things. Anyway, I was laid off along with the entire editorial staff. And when I'm talking to students, I always make a point to say not only the highlights, but the sort of lowlights of a career, because I think you're going to encounter some people like Jeff who will know what they wanted to do since they were very young. And I think I also want to say it's fine if you don't know and if you have some bumps in the road. Um, anyway, I wasn't sure what I was going to do after that. And I heard about this sort of wacky job in China doing some editing related to cultural coverage uh, of the Olympics in 2008. So I went to China for the first time. Um, I worked this job. I did some freelancing, also mostly around the environment. I took Chinese lessons. And I had to come back after about a year because my dad got cancer. Uh, I felt like I needed to be back home in the United States. But that gave me a grounding in China, the Chinese language, and just sort of a taste for the, you know, that I could do that I could do this. I could do this work as a foreign correspondent. And then a couple of years later, I moved back much more intentionally to Beijing and started freelancing, focusing on a lot of science topics. The environment was one. I also wrote about uh, genetics. Um, uh, public health and science magazine, which is this is how I know David, was one of the main places that I that I started working for most consistently, um, and became a contributing correspondent for them. And I also wrote for um, Wired and the New York Times in a number of places. And I think um, just to you know bring this back to, to potential advice for um, people figuring out what they want to do, a lot of what you do I think depends on the window of time that you operate in. Looking back, I feel so lucky that I decided to report in China at a time when science and the environment and China as a global science power were growing, but before it became as difficult to report as it is now. You've probably seen the news about the number of journalists that have been kicked out of China, not because of their own work, but because of global politics. And a lot of bureaus for China are now operating in Taipei and Seoul and Singapore. Um, so I, I would say to, to people who are deciding what to do, your path won't look like mine exactly. It probably won't look like Jeff's uh, or Kendra's, or maybe it will, but a lot of it is figuring out in the moment that you're in, where is the, the greatest need and the greatest interest and how do you match what you're interested in and your abilities with, with where that need is. Um, and uh, anyway, I came back to, to the US in 2018 um, because my husband uh, was, you know, he'd been in China actually for more than a decade and felt like he wanted a change of pace. And so now I work for the Associated Press covering a range of stories, um, mostly about the environment. Although this last year, there's been a lot of COVID coverage also. Great. How about you, Kendra? Um, so my path is a, um, not quite as meandering, I think, as Christina's, but um, <laughs> similarly meandering. I actually got a bachelor's degree in economics, and then I got a master's degree in sustainable development, and then I decided to be a journalist. Um, and so for me, um, I joke that I did everything in the wrong order. So I did a little bit of freelancing, and then I wrote a book, and then I decided that I wanted to be a full-time journalist and sort of gave myself a year to make it work either through freelancing and applying to jobs. And when that didn't happen, I made the decision to apply to graduate school. So I went to MIT's graduate program in science writing and got a journalism degree that way. And then from there, it, my trajectory is pretty, I think, conventional, a little bit compressed, but pretty, if you're lucky, I think a pretty common trajectory for a science journalist. As part of that program, I did an internship at um, Inside Climate News. I knew from the beginning, from the outset, um, Obviously, you don't get a degree in sustainable development if you don't care about the environment. So I knew sort of from the outset that my interest was in science and the environment. And so um, I did an internship at Inside Climate News. I won a fellowship. So I did a reporting trip to Myanmar and um, India sort of shortly at the end of my internship and kind of at the end of the academic portion of my grad program. I graduated and really luckily, like um, Christina was talking about timing, I feel like I kind of graduated at the right time, which is sort of when um, people were, you know, there had been this wave of like elimination of climate and environment desks sort of in the middle 2000s, sort of after the Great Recession. And I graduated at a time when everyone was building that back up again. And I was like, look at me, I have the exact skill set that you say that you want. Um, and so from, uh, you know, from graduation to 
popular science, I think it was three months between, that was like the gap between when I graduated school and when I got my first job from PopSci. I worked at PopSci for about 10 months and from PopSci I went to the New York Times. And then last um, April, I got an offer from Gimlet and I started Gimlet in May and everyone should, I highly recommend starting a job in a pandemic. I don't recommend it. It's been weird. It's been good, but it's been weird. Um, and yeah, that's just sort of been my trajectory. Yeah. Um, I'll just say my my path is in between Christina's and, and Jeff's. I, I uh, grew up in downtown DC. I read John Steinbeck as a kid, The Red Pony, and I thought, wow, it'd be cool to be a writer. And then I grew up in the time of the booming of the environmental movement in the late 70s. And um, so it was a natural interest for me. I was a big bird watcher and I liked to fish and hang out on rivers. And so I got very interested in the intersection between science and policy. And, and I got intrigued by how the, the how what scientists discovered influenced government policy and how what government did uh, had a big impact on the scientific community. And that's pretty much been the intersection that I've been at for 35 years. Um, but David, I, I've heard you tell that story that when you were young, you dreamed about working for NPR and Science Magazine. And that's did. true. I had, uh, those are the two outlets. And yeah, I got, I managed to do both. And it's very rare you get to realize what you think about when you're 19 or 20 years old. So absolutely. Um, I want to jump right to a question. So we're talking today about um, truth, lies, and trust. And so I want to ask you each to tell me, who do you think your audience is right now? And do you think they trust you? <laughs> do they believe you? And, and if you don't, what do you do to earn that trust and, and convey the information that you want to convey? Is there somebody who wants to tackle that head on first? I'll give it a try, David. I mean, I, I would hope that all journalists feel pretty much the same way that we put so much effort into pre preparing and reporting and writing our story that we don't think we can be any more fair. So I, I don't find myself doing anything differently. Um, it's frustrating that a greater percentage of people are distrustful of mainstream media or information in general. Uh, I'm not sure I do anything differently. I, but I am so puzzled by where this rise of distrust in society. I, mean, I, I think a hundred years from now they'll be looking back and saying, you know, it was still the dawn of the of the internet era where you could have affirmation for any particular viewpoint you want just by going online and 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 of course relegating mainstream media or credible media to uh, I don't know to the same same level of competition as questionable media. So I, I don't find myself doing anything different because I don't think how I could be more fair in the stories we do. How about you, Kendra? How do you think about your audience? Who is it? Who, who do you think they are? And what do you think they think of your work? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna answer the question kind of bifurcated and I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of my experience working at PopSci and then contrast it really, I think to my experience now working on a podcast for a Gimlet Spotify. And so one of the interesting things working at Popular Science was at the time, and it's been four years now, so I don't know if things have changed, but at the time, their readership, especially for their print magazine skewed conservative, just based on like where their readership was coming from. So it was an, a science interested audience that oftentimes did not accept the science of climate change. And so my job was a climate reporter and my, and um, you know, there wasn't an explicit, like you need to get this many clicks a day, but there was sort of like, people need to read your work. And so I would very much recognize that I was speaking to an audience who was sort of antagonist, antagonistic to everything that I wanted to tell them or that I you know needed to tell them in terms of news and in terms of science. But it drove so up your clicks, right? They all hated your stories. <laughs> uh, so what's really interesting is you can't, people don't click. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have like, you know, I've not done A-B testing on this, but my assumption was essentially two things. One was that people don't click on stories that they know ahead of time will sort of anger and frustrate them. And this is just broadly an issue I think you have to deal with climate change in general. If you're, even if you're dealing with an audience that accepts the science and is climate friendly and engaged, they're sort of looking at your story as a thing that's going to bum them out. So that's something that you have to overcome kind of in a different way. Um, but so I kind of employed, I, I, I never, I always operated from the frame of people don't want to read this. So how do I get you to read this without resorting to clickbait or scandal or, and there are just like a lot, like oftentimes, um, 
you know, the generally in, in straight kind of news reporting, you begin with like almost essentially like a study released this week said X, right? Like that's kind of like what you begin with. I never began with that. I always began with like, why does this matter? And then I told so you how I know. Mm -hmm. Um, because I needed you to care before I got involved. I leaned very heavily oftentimes. I did a story, this isn't climate, but this is something I think about a lot. I did a story about how humans are infecting kind of the planet with sound. Um, and so I began, it was almost like a parable. It was about, I got really lucky with this researcher who'd done a lot of time in the Arctic and he had this like absolutely bananas, but wonderful story about hearing whale song in the Arctic using, um, uh, a, a kayak paddle or a canoe paddle, like by pressing it against his jawbone. And so like that was the way in. So just relying, like nothing, I don't, I don't want to be manipulated. I don't think my readers or our listeners want to be manipulated, but I do think we also recognize the tools of, you know, you also don't want to be bored to death. And so just leaning into the things that will evoke interest and will evoke curiosity, I think really kind of overcomes that because you also don't want to anger people because if they're reading the thing from a source of anger, they're not, they're also not reading it with the intent to learn. Um, so that was like, I had a very clear audience and with the pops, with um, the podcast is very different and, and very new to me, which is um, there's an intimacy to podcasting that I was very not expecting. <laughs> um, and so it feels like almost like our listeners are on our team, right? You know, they're almost like, um, a family member or a parent or a friend where you just want to tell them the really cool thing that you learned this week. And so it's a very different, it's, it's far more trusting. And in some ways that's actually scarier because, um, you know, we, do, we did a story and we only mentioned a discipline and a, a listener wrote in and they were like, you know, you mentioned this researcher and we didn't even know that this field existed and now I'm going to get a degree in this. Like I, this is exactly the thing that I wanted to do. Or you told me to do this thing, or you told me that this is a potential climate solution and now I'm doing it. I just installed solar panels on my home. And that's like a responsibility that I like on some level just wasn't expecting. And so we're so careful because we don't, we're so careful to tell people like we're not, we're not advocating that you do this. We're just telling you that this is one of a suite of potential climate solutions that the data says this on. Um, and we're also just very um, careful and strict and not at all like, like the bananas technology that might seem like a really cool thing for like a buzzy kind of clicky article is a thing that I like do not do because if it's not real, there's a real risk that somebody will get invested in it in a way that I, we don't want them to, you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. it needs but, to but be audio real. But is also, interesting. you know, that, that idea, having worked in radio myself, I, that intimacy is real. And, but from a storytelling perspective and from a trust perspective, it's also interesting because you get a much better sense of the emotion and the personality of the reporter, right? You can mm -hmm. use inflection, tone of voice, pace, things that, that are harder to do in print, you can do them, but they're easier to do in radio and as a way to connect to the audience. Right. And I think that's part of the reason why so much misinformation comes from talk radio, because hmm. it's, it's hours and hours and hours of listening and you're not listening necessarily even that attentively. And, you know, I don't tell my coworkers, they know this, but like often I listen to things on double speed, you know, and I'm not the only one. There's like an entire generation of people who, so it, that information kind of washes over you and you're less critical because it feels intimate in that way. And so I think because it feels so much intimate and because the way in which we take it in, we can often be less critical. I feel a, an even higher standard of like accountability to my listeners. Interesting. So Christina, I, I'm curious, you know, AP, I don't know how many outlets they serve now. It's thousands probably around the world. So AP feeds stories to thousands of outlets around the world. So you have by far the largest audience <laughs> on this panel. Um, does that, how does that shape your thinking? How do you think about your audience and trust? Well, yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting hearing Kendra and you speak about the intimacy of radio because AP is, is not especially intimate because <laughs> our audience, because a lot of people will read AP content or listen to our, our broadcast or look at our photos and not know that it's AP because it's, it's appearing in the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Kansas City I, I'm Star. just going to call a timeout for all of our poor uh, participants. Uh, Derek Chauvin has been convicted uh, okay. in the jury. Uh, the, the verdict is guilty. I'm not sure on which charge. So for those all of, of them. you who are multitasking, all, all three. three. Thank you, Kendra. So anyway, for those of you who are multitasking, I'm sorry, Christina. No, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you did that, David. Um, 
Uh, so, I, I mean, AP, in a sense, we're trying to talk to everyone, which is a huge challenge. And, you know, it's interesting in debates about the future of media. Does it make sense to try to talk to everyone in one platform? Or are we going to see more outlets be more successful in the future that have very specific audiences? So when I wrote for science, I assumed that my audience was either scientists, would be scientists, people who are very interested in science. And so AP, it is a different challenge. Um, I think that some of the things that we've done are we do a lot of um, fact checks, um, you know, I guess like during the Trump years that, that we would do a lot more real time fact checking than we did before. And the idea was to try to not just have science be in like the science section of the paper, but to bring that sort of rigor and fact checking methodology to coverage of high profile political events or speakers. Um, I think that personally, I try both with my sources and when I'm talking about it to explain the process. I think sometimes, you know, I mean, it's, it, interacting with people who are not journalists, they, you know, I've, I've often had the question that, so the anonymous source, how can you trust it? And I'm like, the anonymous source is not anonymous to the journalist right. or to the editor, but that's a reasonable question that someone might have. Who are these anonymous sources saying there was this bad government program? And so I think, there is more burden on us to try to explain our process. Um, I think that one thing that is a challenge and I don't have the perfect answer is that science is by nature iterative. And so I mentioned that I um, have been reporting a lot in the last year about um, COVID. So about a year ago, of course, the CDC was not recommending that people wear facial masks and AP and many other outlets, you know, did pieces on, well, should you wear a facial mask, should you not? Maybe not. And then several months later, AP and several outlets ran pieces reflecting the, the new consensus, which is that, in fact, we think that a facial mask is probably a very important tool in controlling the pandemic. And so someone might be like, well, what's up? Were you guys wrong? And it's, it, it's, it's not a black and white thing. It's that we're reporting the, the, the best information of scientists who are moving toward an answer. There's no, there's rarely a final answer in science. I mean, something like with climate change, I mean, any big story, you're, it, it's a process of gathering information and testing hypotheses. And, you know, there's always new research coming in. And so it, for me, enmeshed in this world, it makes sense that answers build upon each other. And that if the first answer you have is not the same as the last answer, it doesn't mean that something is wrong. But I feel that is something we have to explain to the public. Um, and, you know, I mean, how do I do that? I don't do that in the context of every AP story, but I try to, you know, on panels like this or with friends, explain that that, that, that is how science works. And um, please don't not trust experts because they didn't know everything at once. The other thing I think I wanted to mention that, I th that is, is relevant to this conversation, I believe, about the role of trust or distrust of the media. Um, and again, I'm thinking about COVID. Um, these changes like the internet, the growth of social media are global, but uh, it is also the case um, that in other countries, you, it, let's, you know, um, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, I, I'm picking democratic countries because China is a bit trickier to talk about as a very different political system, but other countries with free and open media where the government was much more, the government acted much quicker on science about controlling the pandemic from the outset. And the public which is such a huge concept, but by and large, people were more responsive to the idea that they needed to stay home or wear face masks than in a situation like the United States. Um, I think there are larger political forces at work that, for example, I mean, we, we could, I, I don't wanna, we, we could talk about this endlessly, but I mean, I think that, that the, the easiest way to, um, if, if you're a political force or, or interest group to, um, rebut a message that you don't like, for example, a message urging restraints on whatever your industry is, is to try to undermine the credibility of 
the messenger. And I think that America, you know, aspects of our of our free speech tradition and some of our, I mean, there's lots to say there, but I guess what I wanna say is that we're operating in a context where we're producing journalism, but we're in this bigger world. And that what I see happening in this country has some similarities and some dissimilarities with other countries that have the same technology and the same issues. And so I think that the solution to disinformation will partly lie with us, but partly lie with larger structures, um, I think, that need to stand up for the credibility and importance of science. David, hey, well, I, I th go ahead, Jeff. No, just real quickly, I think she brings up some excellent points. And, and in fact, I think a lot of the distrust, at least in the United States, comes from this blurring of straight journalism and commentary or hosting, if you will, on cable television. You know, we all know the distinction between straight reporting and commentary, but the average person just clicks on the TV and thinks that's journalism. And it's and it's not, and it drives me crazy. And it's true even with print in some cases, because commentaries or or opinions are not are not very well marked. They're they're slightly marked, and I think there should be a big flashing light on it, and just a big way to really delineate the, the difference and the, the the line between commentary, hired talking heads, and straight journalism from a reporter. I mean, I. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think there is that element of it for sure, but I also think we have to acknowledge. So, like, using the example of like the open up protests when they first happened that same weekend when sort of the big ones that were getting kind of national attention were, was happening, there were actually a series of like keep it closed protests. There were a series of protesters around the country doing socially distanced body bag protests in front of Trump properties. But those got a fraction of the attention as a keep it open protest, in part because polling showed at that time that keeping it closed was actually what most people in the United States wanted. And there's a there's a certain element, I think, of journalism where we, we like the oddity, but, but what we haven't fully reconciled with is media magnification, where in turn, by focusing so much on the oddity and on the fringe, mm -hmm. we actually normalize it and make it seem like it's a much bigger thing than it is. Um, we do that with climate denialism. Um, to this day, I often, people are always like, well, I wanna to talk to you about the denialists. I'm like, they're a tiny percentage. And I was like, yes, you know, prior to January, they're in the administration, but, but by and large, like this is not where we need to be devoting our energies, not in convincing people that climate change is happening. Most people in this country are on board, like we're, we're past that. But you spend 10 years sort of focusing on climate denial and it takes people a while to get that message. And so I think there's like a middle ground in, in there too, where we need to hold ourselves to higher standard of what is news. Right, and what is the, what can, if you, if there is a mainstream, can you discern it? Or, or even if they're not in the mainstream, but they're right, should you focus on the folks that you think have evidence and data? Um, I want to circle back to something that each of you just touched on briefly, which is sort of the fragmentation in the media marketplace that we've seen. Uh, I, my joke is uh, we spent 20 years talking about how the internet was going to destroy journalism, and then it did. Um, <laughs> but, um, so on one hand, you have this incredible democratization of information, right? Anybody can be a podcaster, anybody can be a journalist, a journalist, anybody can do it. So there's multiple sources of information compared to when I grew up where there were basically three major television networks. Folks like Jacques Cousteau could amass enormous global audiences because there wasn't much choice. So on balance, where do you see this, the pros and cons of this incredible fragmentation? I mean, Gimlet would not exist without this fragmentation, for example. Um, how, do you, how do you feel in our world where we are, we are constantly dealing with data, try, trying to parse evidence, trying to understand things like that, um, where the weight of the evidence is? Is the fragmentation good, bad, cancel each other out? Anybody want to take a swing at that? I mean, my job literally wouldn't exist without media fragmentation. I'm probably the <laughs> weirdest person on this panel, which is I work for a podcasting company that's a wholly owned subsidiary of a tech company, um, which is weird. And then I often forget I work for a tech company and then every so often they mail me swag and I'm like, oh yeah, this is what you guys do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you mail me sweatpants. <laughs> like that is how tech works. Um, I will say though, like, I think that they're obviously they're, I guess what I feel like is it is easy to blame 
there are kind of two threads. One is like the financial underpinnings of media and how the internet sort of broke that up. And that is real. And that is a conversation that I don't feel capable of having because I just don't, I don't think I have the language for that. But I think there's this other question of whose voices get heard. And I think um, when you look back at sort of all of the, the things, you know, like the fake news and the alternate facts, all of these existed before the internet. There was conservative, you know, far right wing talk radio. There were other ways of people to kind of exist in these silos. I think for me, the thing that has been really great and elevated is there's a greater accountability. Like when you, when an, an institution that in the past would have been sort of untouchable, um, like this isn't science, but like the Tom Cotton op-ed, for example, that level of backlash would have been almost impossible before the internet. And I think that it, it there's it, this fragmentation in the rise of the internet holds a certain level of accountability and a certain level of voices that we would not be hearing. Like, I don't think we'd be hearing from trans voices the way we're hearing about them from them without the internet. So I think we have to also recognize that like, part of the reason why some institutions I think are struggling is because those institutions have long not actually served the American people and it, the internet just made that clear. Like it gave people options. Yeah, I mean, in science, I see this double-edged sword all the time. On, on one hand, we have these unbelievable Twitter mobs that go after researchers who publish bad papers, right? Or, or con could commit misconduct or you know, publish flawed data. And it gets called out much more quickly because there are so many, it's crowdsourced now. Um, so yeah, that, that side of it is interesting. The accountability and the error correcting occurs on at almost a light speed <laughs> pace now, which makes it hard to keep up with. Uh, Christina, Jeff, did you guys want to throw anything in on this idea? Well, I think we, we certainly can't, can't put the internet back in the bottle, so it's here to stay. And, the, and the, there are some really big downsides to it, uh, like the economics of journalism itself. But yeah, there's an awful lot of good things. And out of the turmoil, will slowly come some really important new institutions like Gimlin, like all, all, the, all the other kind of um, new forms of plat news platforms rising from what many consider to be the ashes. And so uh, I, I'm the eternal optimist. I think there are gonna be some great things that come out of it. And I think the democratization overall is a really good thing. Um, there are gonna be some serious bumps along the way and it may take generations to smooth out. Yeah, I'll just add, I guess, as a, as a media consumer, I love it. I love quirky <laughs> voices. I love the fact that there's like a podcast or like a blog devoted to some, you know, crazy intersection of interests that would never have been big enough for, you know, a mainstream publication. As a journalist, yes, it's sometimes terrifying because of the business model really being in flux. Um, and I think, um, you know, I guess to bring it back to you know what what you know if people are listening thinking they may they're weighing whether they want to be journalists I think it does because the iterations are really quick you know podcasts weren't a big thing I don't know how many years ago but some odd number of years ago and you know now people have sub stacks and um, do you remember the pivot to video and then there wasn't the pivot to video <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know Substack is a new newsletter. <laughs> service that is shaking, supposedly going to shake up journalism, like everything that came before it was going to shake up journalism. Uh, but it's allowed individual writers to some of them to make substantial amounts of money, essentially selling their unfiltered writing. So I guess what I want to say is that it I feel like it makes you have to be a lot more nimble in your own format and your own idea of who you are, what your product is as a journalist. And I mean, obviously you and Kendra and I guess Jeff have all made the leap between um, audio and, and print. Um, but I think that we, were, we have to constantly like evolve. I guess when I was like a kid, oh, here's my cat. Um, when I was a small kid, maybe I thought like, oh, once I get to a certain age or a certain position, like I'll have it all figured out and I'll just like coast. But no, that's not it at all because we're constantly <laughs> are reinventing ourselves and our, our outlets and the way we have these conversations. So I guess that's good in a way that you, you have to keep really being actively engaged and keep an eye on the horizon. But, you know, it's, 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 I guess it's just said, it's not, it's not going away. Yeah. So let's just figure out what we can do. We have a question uh, from a, from a listener or viewer, whatever we call them on zoom. Um, and I'm, I'm reminding people the Q&A is open. Throw your, throw your questions in there. If you have a question about how, we, how do we decide which sources to trust? How do we decide which quotes to use? 
Where do we find our stories? A lot of people are interested in those kinds of things. So let us know. Uh, so this is a question that says, uh, among Generation Z readers, headline reading is often a pretty common source for misinformation. From your experience in the industry, what can journalism do to reduce misinformation from headline reading? And I will just add, I ran into an old friend the other day who has now turned himself into a tech person. And what does his little company do? It is using AI to generate headlines, automated headlines for news services. So with that, <laughs> headlines. Headlines are a problem, right? Right. I've heard this AI headline writing, and, and they, they brag that as a percentage, it's more attracting a reader than a, than a human written headline might be. That's dangerous, but reality, I suppose. Uh, you're right. I mean, lawyers tell you all the time you can get sued. Most lawsuits happen because of the headlines and or the tease and TV news than uh, than in the actual story itself. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that they're a headline writer for you know if they if they still exist um, is is a really really important component of any newsroom and the, and and volatile as well. A lot. I think most readers think think that the reporter writes the headline, and I'd be interested in hearing from Christina and. And KPL of whether that is the case with you guys. Are you ever in position to write your own headlines when you were working for uh, you know a mainstream newsroom? Andrew, did you write those New York Times headlines? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I did not. Uh, and also um, at Popsa, you would like they often would ask you to. Say, I'm a terrible headline writer. Like I'm a very boring headline writer. I shouldn't say terrible, but I'm a very boring headline writer. So like at Popsa. I, uh, I would sometimes suggest, and I think in 10 months it, out of hundreds of stories, like three of my headlines made it that are like, it is not a skill, which is weird because I think I'm decent on Twitter, but headline writing and tweets are very different and I'm just not in a skilled headline writer. But I think the biggest thing that headline writers could do is read, read the headline as though you have bad intent. Like literally, like that is literally the easiest thing to do to make sure it's not problematic it's just like read it like with the worst intentions in mind read it in like the like complete bad faith and that i think curbs a lot of misinformation i, I know in my own newsroom um anybody is free to suggest a headline for a story the reporter either of the two editors that usually work on any given story um i will also say it's the, social media has imposed a lot of uh so print imposes a constraint, right? You only have a certain amount of length usually to get that headline in, and it's usually not very long. Um, my favorite headline of all time, headless body found in topless bar. Brilliant. Um, so, um, so the New York Post. That's the New York Post, some of the best headline writers out there. Um, but, you know, we're, we're about to move to a publishing platform. I think we're only going to have 80 or 75 characters spaces and characters to write a headline. So just think about that for a minute. I'm in 60 uh, characters. You're at <laughs> Christine is already there. They beat us. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the constraints are intense. And so the 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 uh, possibility of a bad headline or a misleading headline is real. Yeah, I, I would say just on that, I mean, I hear I definitely don't speak for AP. We have a 60 character headline. It is hard. It is, it is, and especially like how many words are there for scientists, right? You know, like so you're like, is there a word for scientists that only has five, you know, characters? There's not, but you just, you know, and um yeah. Scientist so, is shorter than researcher, however, I can tell you. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, I mean, I think I I I you know, you you just told me you guys are moving towards shorter headlines. I mean, I wish there was a way to have more space. Um, I mean, I do when I wrote for places like the Atlantic or Foreign Policy, um, they, you know, usually they would have a short, punchy headline that would be two or three words that would just simply be something evocative and a deck, which is the like the line under the headline that would just spell out really what the article is. And I thought that that space allowed you to do more justice in summarizing it. I will say, um, per our earlier discussion about the uh, quick responsiveness of readers, um, there is a much greater opportunity to quickly correct a bad headline if it comes to your attention. And that's something I know that my organization often does um, because you know we, we can be much more responsive in that way. Something doesn't languish for a week and then we, then, then we say, oh gosh, we feel bad about it. Yeah, same here. Uh, that's true. 
Um, we, the questions are now pouring in. <laughs> so I'm just going to hit a couple of them quickly here. I'll try to lump some of them together. Um, so this is a big issue that's come up during COVID. How do you know, how does the reader, how do we expect the average person or the average reader or listener or viewer to know whether a study has been peer reviewed or not? And this has come up in COVID in big time, of course, because the research community was trying to move so fast that they issued what are called preprints. These are studies that are generally not peer reviewed uh, because they, it was very important to the community to get the information out, get it moving quickly. But of course, the downside was, of course, some of those preprints turned out to be deeply, deeply flawed. Um, how do each of you think about this problem? Reporters have to be important and give the context. You know, I always told the people in my newsroom, if they find out if a report is peer reviewed and if it is, say so. If, if you think the phrase peer reviewed is unknown to many of the viewers, then explain what it is. And if it's not, then that's important to do so as well. I remember every... And the approach to every Valentine's Day, there's always a chocolate industry study that comes out about the health benefits of chocolate. And I, I would just scream at the producers every year about uh, you know, the end of January, watch out for these stupid um, chocolate studies. Um, now, the, co the COVID situation is different, but it's important to give that context as well. So I think it's just basic reporting to make sure that happens. Anybody else want to toss anything in on that? Yeah, I think that's the, the responsible journalists will tell you uh, now, the, part of this question also was, how can an average person do their own research? I would say to that, that Google Scholar is an unbelievable resource. Uh, it's publicly available, you can quickly see, you know, type in the subject or the author or whatever, and you will quickly get a list in Google Scholar of everything that that researcher has done, where the paper appeared, so forth and so on. They often now show the preprints, but they, it's clear it's a preprint because you can usually figure out it's on a preprint server. But yeah, this whole issue of the speed. So again, we're touching on the democratization, the speeding up of the news cycle, the speeding up of the scientific cycle, all of which leaves less time for us as journalists often to evaluate and report, um, give context for these various kinds of stories. Yeah. I, I will say on that, so I mean, in on my team, uh, basically, the, the default is we only cover peer reviewed studies and we say the journal that they're in. So, you know, a study published Wednesday in the journal Nature, Nature only publishes peer reviewed journals, uh, peer reviewed articles. Um, and we will quote both the researcher and a couple of people who are not, who are not um, part of the team that wrote the study but I'll have some expertise that's germane to that topic to say, hey, does this look important? Is this new? Does the methodology look all right? And, you know, I, I can say I've had a couple of times running a study by, we call them outside experts, uh, when they pointed out really significant methodological flaws. And I thought, wow, it is peer reviewed, but I, I, I see a problem. A bad and, study. <laughs> and I, you know, darn, it would have been such a fun thing to cover <laughs> if it was that, you know, I, I've said, you know, we've got these qualms and we haven't covered it. So that's the default. When when AP covers um, preprints, it, it's sort of like we make an exception to cover preprint, right? Mm -hmm. And if you do, then that article would explain why and what the, what the caveat is. So if you see something in AP story, it's peer reviewed unless there's an explanation of why it's not peer reviewed, but it was still worthy of coverage. Yeah, I mean, I'm proud to work in a newsroom where <laughs> at least several times a year we trash papers that are appearing in our own journals. So we, we write news stories about our own papers. It basically says this is not a very good study. Um, but I think it speaks to the to AAAS's decision to make the newsroom a very independent operation and gives us the freedom to, to report on what's important. Um, and that's good reporting. People are asking, how do you evaluate these studies? What Christina just described is how you do this. You you know, if, if you're an experienced reporter, you, you find other knowledgeable sources and you ask them to evaluate a, a new paper or a new finding. And then you hopefully try to give the reader context for, you know, what people think of that finding. So, um, process of science. We have a question here about the process of science. When I was a very young reporter, I a, a very influential guy told me, he said, yeah, he says, you know, reporting science. You go to a lab, you say, what did you discover today? And the scientist says, nothing. The experiment failed. 
<laughs> you don't have a story, right? That's not a story. <laughs> but, but that's 90% of what science is, right? It's the, it's the lack of progress, not the big breakthrough. So how do you guys think about process of science? Do we do, do we help average readers and listeners and viewers ex understand this process? And um, I think it really, I think it depends on the study and it depends on the conclusions of that study, right? Like, uh, I'm not going to name the study, but years ago, I, <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason. Um, uh, I, I was tasked with doing a story on a study and I told my editor at the time that we shouldn't do it, uh, to Christina's point. It was, um, and the reason, it was actually like as a science nerd, it was actually a really cool study, like what they were attempting to do was really cool, but it was a new, um, it was an outsized result. So like they they were researching something other people had looked at, but they found a much bigger effect um, and it was using a novel methodology and it hadn't been replicated. So there's like a lot of red flags all the way down. And the only reason it would be of interest, sometimes that sort of story is worth doing anyway, because the method is so like, it was a story I felt like if had I been writing for science or something, it would have been worth doing because the method was so interesting. The fact that it wasn't replicable, the fact that the, it didn't have, um, we couldn't trust the conclusions almost didn't matter. Um, I know that sounds like a weird thing, but like the method was so new and so novel and so interesting that to a science literate and a science interested audience, the idea that somebody might come along and repeat it and give us keen insight, it would be worth it to them. Like you can downplay the results and mostly focus on the methodology, but I wasn't writing for a science interested audience. I was writing for a national publication. And so the only thing that mattered really to our audience was the result. And I was very adamant that we couldn't trust the result. And so they, they were like, yeah, that's cool and all, but we, you're going to write it anyway. And I, and I remember <laughs> looking my editor in the eye and I was like, the only way I'm writing this story. And, and uh, another public- The, the reason reporter I falls do, on pen. <laughs> yes. The reason I had to do it was another publication had done the story, the study, and they had done a really big splashy thing about it. And they were like, you have to do it because it's getting all its attention. Pierre Louis, we got to flood the zone. We got to match the story. Yeah. And so I remember looking at my editor like dead in the eye. And I was like, the only way I'm putting my name on this is if I can say in every paragraph that we can't trust the conclusion. I'm like, this because oftentimes my methodology would get cut in my in the at this publication. I was like, this is a story where we're doing the method and we're explaining that we can't trust the method. And it completely saved my beacon because the story, the study ended up getting retracted. Um, they had made um an error and the error met made the conclusion no longer move and like no i don't there was nothing the theories about it it was just bad math they made a mathematical error and it was this whole cascading thing and and to this day i'm still so mad that my name is on this story that i didn't even want to do in the first place <laughs> that has this massive like the study got retracted note on it but like so the thing that i outlined sorry to get back to the question is like that's kind of one of the ways that you know whether or not a study is worth doing and also know when to you know i did a story one time and this one i will name and it was basically about ghost moose which are a phenomenon in new england because um the, the wind there isn't as much snow and this, the snow is coming at a weird time because of climate change and there have been escalating moose populations that they they end up with these ticks that suck all the blood out of them and then they rub up against these trees to get the fur off of them and so i did a study one a story one time where it was literally like he found i don't remember the number but it was like some ghastly number of dead of ticks on a dead moose on a dead ghost that is not a story where you're like i really need to trust it. you know what i mean like he's counting ticks <laughs> like there isn't a lot of stuff it's, it's what we call a one data point story <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you you i think that's one of the things that you sort of develop over time is sort of like like you know you're alluding to with the chocolate study like you you develop a sense of like there are certain kinds of stories that smell funny or studies that smell funny and you get a sense over time when you need to do a little bit more digging and when it's just like so i mean it's so obvious that you just like you do it and and you don't need to explain the methodology like i'm not going to sit here and explain how this you know in detail how this man counts ticks on a moose you know i might do a sentence or two but like the listener doesn't really need to know and there isn't a whole lot of process there but if you're doing something like a vaccine story and you're talking about like the evolution of um, the mRNA vaccines and why we should trust them, that is something that you kind of need to go into the process because you want people to understand how we got a vaccine in a year and why the public should be able to trust it. Yeah, for Christina, do you want to toss anything in? Yeah, I guess um, what I was thinking about was, um, I hope I'm interpreting the question all right, um, 
but um, like, is it, is it worth is it worth doing a story even if we don't have like a, like a, a definitive you know airtight conclusion? And um, personally, some of my favorite stories to do are basically question stories. I think what often starts me interested in something is a, is a question. Um, like, why does this happen? And I love profiling people who are trying to answer interesting questions or important questions. And um, I mean, I, I definitely want to like overstate the case or have flawed data, but like you sort of depict, here's a really interesting question. Here's the work they're doing to try to answer it. And here's some work that might lead in a counter direction. And so the point of it isn't, this is, you know, th this is the truth, but like, Here's something to think about. I guess one thing that comes to mind actually is um, there's a lot of debate about where dogs were first domesticated. Um, dogs were the um, the only animal that was domesticated um, by hunter gatherers. So prior to the agricultural revolution, and I have a dog, and I love dogs, and I have this cheesy cap here that says "dog lover." So um, I'm a sucker for dog stories. But um, there's been a lot of, of really conflicting research about whether dogs originated in one location or multiple locations, and it sort of flips back and forth. But I could see a study, I see a story, you know, posing the question why it's interesting and helping the reader understand something about how science works and how you have conflicting veins of evidence wherein the takeaway is, wow, man's best friend, we still don't know from whence it came, you know, like the wrong takeaway would be dogs, they came from China, period, because we don't know that yet. There's so, some people think yes, Asia, some people think Europe. But um, but I think as a reader anyway, sometimes a study, uh, sometimes a story that's really about people on a quest answering a really interesting question. I think that's also the case with human origin stories or a lot of archeology span studies um, where people are like, oh, what really, you know, like. What, what was this aspect of life really like, you know, before before um, Mount Vesuvius erupted or something? You, you know, you don't, you, you maybe you can't fully tell the entire story, but you can profile there's someone. No, there's no end out right? there. You've got yeah. the beginning and the middle, but there's no end. Yeah. And yeah. I guess that that maybe that is also a reader preference, but um, it's like people on a quest, a quest right. story. Right. Jeff, you know, this discussion reminds me of the kinds of stories I know you and I have both done where sometimes the evidence is not in dispute. Often in environmental stories, the evidence may not be in dispute, right? Logging is going to take that forest down. The dispute is over values, right? And the dispute is over, uh, you know, for example, you know, knowing that carbon dioxide is building up in the environment, in the atmosphere is an irre you know, irrefutable fact, but that fact does not tell you whether a carbon tax system is better than a cap and trade system is better than doing nothing from a policy perspective. So when you think about environmental studies that are more about sort of policy decisions that have an element of science and evidence, how do you handle those? Well, you can talk to all sides, not just both sides. I mean, there is no, uh, I mean, you have to be careful because this is one of those areas where you really need to uh, engage closely with all major viewpoints and, and be careful probably not to pick one unless it's abundantly clear. You know, there's the old adage uh, that, um, you know, a story isn't proper journalism. It gives equal weight to both sides of the story because sometimes the science and the policy doesn't, uh, is not equally split. Um, you don't give half the story to the fact that you know, cigarettes might not cause cancer. Um, so it's not, uh, science is not always a he said, she said, but it's certainly incumbent upon th in those kinds of stories to really engage closely with both sides. And, and in television, you know, you have so many other tools to help tell your story too. You have spoken word, you have moving pictures, you have sound. Um, and, and so there's a real opportunity, to, I, I feel, to get into the, the intangible aspects of, a, of an environment or a nature story. I often say that on coral reef stories, you know, television is, is able to take the viewer down to the bottom of the ocean to, to look at those moving pictures. And there's great tools there to help really advance the story. And I think th those kinds of tools also help identify a, a wiser policy that might come out of it. Some of you, all of you have touched briefly, you know, there's a different difference between misinformation and disinformation. Yes. You know, misinformation is just 
it's not right. <laughs> Disinformation, in my opinion, is the intentional spreading of falsehood, right? right. Um, and we see both now. And I'm, you've touched on, you know, the, the chocolate company that sponsors a study that they know is going to say that their chocolate is really good mm. may not be disinformation, but it comes pretty close. Um, and you can sort of suss that out by looking at who funded the study and things like that. Are, are any of you feeling a greater need now to sort of be on the alert for disinformation? <laughs> Sorry. I mean, so, yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, um, a AP has a fact check team that does sort of quick response fact checks about misinformation related to science and other topics. I'm not on that team. Um, and although I think that work is really important, that's not my, I, you know, I mean, we, we, like you lead different kinds of journalism. So this isn't, you know, a, one thing is better than the other, but I was going to say, there definitely are people at AP who, who, really are look on the lookout for disinformation and feel that to you know um, and i think that that really um that impulse really grew in the last four years when i think there was a lot of um bad faith um bad faith statements being made um by people and organizations that had an audience to support their end so um yeah i think i, th I think someone in the media landscape needs to be be doing it. I think it's important. Yeah, for Kendra. Any thought? Um, I know that climate disinformation is becoming more of a thing. Um, I do feel so. Uh, I'm trying not to like step on some of the reporting lines that I'm doing, but like more broadly, <laughs> I will say. Um, <laughs> All your competitors are listening. I just want you to know. Well, everything in audio takes a really long time, or not everything, but audio <laughs> takes a really long time. So it's one of those things where I'm like, like it was one of those things where it's like, you know, print. I'm like, oh, this story's coming out next week. It's fine. But in audio, I'm like, this story is coming out in December. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that I think a um a lot of about is um. Uh, this isn't a story, sorry, I'm gonna, this isn't something I did for uh, the podcast, this is something I did on the side for a blog, but um, recently, like Exxon made a statement, um, recently a reporter slash friend made a statement about the links between um, oil and gas and white supremacy, and Exxon put out this like really, in my opinion, disinformation based statement about how there, there are no links to oil and gas, and so I ended up writing this long historical piece about the long history between the oil industry and white supremacy, because it's been documented everything from, you know, calling people the N word to um, sort of how they they do their business. And so that is a thing that I think is ramping up. I, I think as industry sort of like the merchants of doubt level of disinformation that um, God, I'm blinking on her name right now um, at Harvard <laughs> sort of documented. Oh, merchants kind of, of doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that level of, I don't think that's ever gone away. And I think as it becomes clearer that countries are moving towards climate action, that level of disinformation is ramping up um, again. And so I think in that regard, you have to be on the lookout. And also it's beginning to align with sort of very right-wing white supremacist movements that are kind of like, um, that are using climate change as a new reason to believe in genocide. Um, so so uh, uh, Kendra's talking about uh, Naomi Oreskes at Harvard who wrote a book you. called Merchants of Doubt, which is uh, based in part on, you know, really amazing documentation that's been done over the years. Of, for example, the tobacco industry, uh, industry's effort to completely undermine the science uh, tying tobacco use to cancer. Uh, later, the effort to undermine climate science by various forces within the fossil fuel and auto industries. Um, there are other examples as well of, of concerted effort by vested interests to undermine science that they don't like for whatever reason. And I um, I did a story one time about coal ash and I used the word toxic, I called coal ash toxic. And um, a, a utility who I was reporting on, you know, really took umbrage with the fact that these were toxic. And they were like, according to the EPA, it doesn't meet the standard of toxic waste and I was like okay well that whole process of how a thing what is considered toxic or not is politically fraught and I'm using toxic colloquially not um like 
to meet a legal standard and colloquially nope, drink slash, slash <laughs> toxic, right? Like the way that a normal person understands what toxic means, colash meets that threshold. And I feel like those kinds of things come up over and over and over again when you're dealing with pollution and industry in that way and having to thread that needle really carefully and recognize that they are going to put stumbling blocks in front of you because, you know, your story is a threat to their bottom line. Right. Right. Can I say one thing that just occurred to me, which is sort of along the lines of misinformation and disinformation, I guess it's sort of bad faith treatment, um, something that, that has emerged in more force, I'd say, in the last year or two, and that I think individual journalists and media organizations are trying to think about more, is um, disinformation or misinformation, I guess disinformation campaigns about particular journalists that are unfair and put those people in compromised or threatened positions. Um, I, I can't think of an environmental case offhand, but for example, there's a young, youngish technology reporter at the New York Times who um, a right wing uh, talk, a right wing TV host um, mentioned her and, um, and basically then some of his uh, viewers sort of set out a Twitter mob and were threatening her and, and you know, and I have another friend at the Washington Post who's reported on Oh, sorry, who, who came out as a survivor of sexual assault. And, um, and, in, and, and there have just been, um, it, it, that, that story's a bit long, but basically she's had people targeting her for her reporting and her, her life online. Um, and, at, and some people put out her address. And at one point she had to go, leave her home and go to a hotel and was working with her company to figure out whether or not they would provide security. And I think, so disinformation or, you know, we could talk about like intellectually as a problem, but also I think it, some individual journalists are targeted. And I mean, in particular women and people of color, but more broadly anybody. And I think that's something that, that I, I, again, a, a fact of the media landscape and everybody having voice on social media and, and organized bad actors um, can make much more dangerous than in the past. And I don't know the answer, but I just wanted to flag that as, as a part of this sort of disinformation conversation. And, and that to, reminds to, me, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, it reminds me of something I learned in an early newsroom I worked in, which was, you know, I had an editor who really impressed on, you know, accuracy is not important just for accuracy's sake, but it also is important because once you make a mistake in a reporter, the, the, the seed of distrust is sown. Right, because the question then becomes, well, if you made that mistake, can I trust your other reporting? Right, and we actually have seen many instances where the re revelation of one mistake in a story turns out to be just the beginning of a thread that you pull, and then you realize the whole story is flawed or the, the reporter was committing misconduct. So, it, yeah, it's uh, but this this trend of attacking individual reporters is definitely very worrying. I also think Christine is getting at a slightly different point, which is um, the place that where I see this the most, like um, I am friendly with an, a decent number of um, women who cover space. Um, and I always know that they're about to write a story that does not portray um, SpaceX favorably because they have to lock their Twitter. Because the number of people who are, um, who are Elon Musk fans and violent about it and the way in which he foments, you know, he's very anti the media. Tesla doesn't have a media department. Um, he's spoken out against the media several times. So even if your reporting is bulletproof, the fact that you were speaking in any way negatively about one of his companies or him, um, especially as a woman, opens you up to a level of vitriol and, and you know, doxing and um, harassment. Um, that frankly is, you know, barbaric. It's, it's, it's not, you know what I mean? Like it, it is not something I think anyone signed up for. Um, it's why, you know, my tweets delete, not because, I mean, I try to be factual or whatever, but like, that isn't why it's because you don't want someone going through your timeline and you made a comment to someone and their tweet is deleted. And now your comment is hanging out in the ether and it looks problematic when at the time and in context, it's completely you know, banal, I pay for a service to delete the places that I have lived in the past off the internet. Like these are things that I think, um, and it's completely because of these these campaigns, these targeted harassment campaigns. It's like in, like in preparation of. Yeah, well, and I think sadly, there's also a gender divide here. I, my experience is, is that 
women are, are far more subject, tend to, for whatever reason, tend to be far more subject to these campaigns than, than male reporters. It, it's why it, it, I originally put Kermit the Frog sipping tea as my Twitter icon as a joke, but I don't change it now because it cuts down on harassment because mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like just not being visibly female makes it easier to be on the internet. Yeah. Even if my name is, you know, clearly a girl's name. <laughs> right. Um, we have our, so coming back to this question of, of um, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, the criticism of climate coverage was it was always PhD A versus PhD B, except PhD B had almost no evidence to support their position and PhD A had tons of evidence to support their position. Um, so a, a, a viewer is asking, you know, should we be saying the quiet part out loud? He refers to a quote that apparently has gotten Lester Hold in trouble, where he said fairness is overrated, but it was in the context of you don't give equal weight, as Jeff said, if the evidence is not equal. Um, do you think we do a good enough job as journalists as making people understand that part of our jobs is to, to try to evaluate evidence? I mean, this is the value add in theory that journalism adds, right? We are evaluating various kinds of evidence and trying to give readers the best perspective we can on the story. But should we be should we be making it more clear or how we do that? Uh, Christina, you talked about you know being clearer about methods or how we do things. Um, gosh, I mean, I think that well, um, I mean, I guess it's it's one of these things that maybe you would have to look at it like an individual story. I mean, I feel like most of the stories that I that I read do or have read recently do a pretty good job of of waiting but i guess an example that 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 comes to my mind right now is obviously with the johnson and johnson vaccine okay so this has been used on millions of people a small number small relative to the whole number of women have developed blood clots that is something that should be reported but how do you contextualize that right and obviously the regulators are also trying to figure out how much importance that that um that should have and should the should the vaccine rollout continue or should it continue but with you know a different safety notice or should it not continue and so there's a lot of different voices and the matter is really grave it's it's the vaccine to stop the pandemic or one of the vaccines to stop the pandemic and so i was um i was actually in an uber this morning and um i heard a radio station um not that anyone here is affiliated with and they were like the, the life-threatening blood clots and I, a little bit of me winced because I felt like that put the emphasis a bit in the wrong place mm -hmm. that that relative to the larger number of people um, it, it's it, you know uh, it, you know I guess the vaccine has been safe for you know 99.95 percent I'm making up a number here of people but um, but it's tricky right because you do have you 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 don't want to not mention the fact that problems um, seem to have been detected but you also don't want the reader to walk away thinking well gosh vaccines are dangerous I'm going to stay way away and um, that's not exactly the same analogy that the the question had but that's just a very concrete example that I feel like. I, I'm wrestling with and, and other news organizations are wrestling with how to weight that and then how do you condense that into a 60 or 70 character headline to get across mm -hmm. that correct weighting of information. Yeah, right. well, a common <laughs> critique of, you know, is you know, we all struggle with relative versus absolute risk. So you see studies that says, you know, drinking coffee increases your rate of X disease by 10 times. Well, of course, your rate of X disease was only 0.1. So you went, you know, so now you have a half a percent chance of getting X disease. Pete, you have a question. Uh, it's sort of related to what uh, Christina was just saying, and that is, well, first of all, I think we chose I, the wrong, the, all these guys are just way too ethical. That's clear. That, you know, you're all <laughs> the, the best organizations, you really think clearly about what you're doing, and you're all scientists at heart. But people that are getting information out there across the world aren't getting their information always from AP or science or an incredible uh, podcast like, like Gimlet or, or TV productions that, that Jeff's doing, they're getting their information from the Huffington Post or, or other places that don't have the same sorts of edits or editors that are really careful that have a that have an ethical approach to the information that's that's put out there. So I'm wondering what sort of advice you would give to readers to sort of how to be more critical in looking at their science or environmental reporting. What are the what are the things like the headline, you know, <laughs> that Christina just referred to? Um, 
like that. Wait, why don't we do a whip around and let's, let's each throw out one thing that a reader should look for. I think one we've, we've touched on is the study peer reviewed, mm -hmm. right? I think they should look in a story and see, does it say whether if it's based on a study is what, is that study peer reviewed or not? Who else has another one? They I've should got have. one. I've got, I've got a good one. Uh, typos, especially bad typos. It generally means that no set of human eyes from the editors has looked at that story before it got posted. So if it's got typos, forget it. Forget it. Yeah. I mean, I, I even have friends who won a Pulitzer Prize who said they admit that some of their stuff goes, gets posted before an editor actually reads it. And that's just a fact today. So typos are the dead giveaway. What's anybody uh, else got? Second source. But ah. I will say, wait, I would say generally, especially if it's not insects on a moose story, like it really needs to have <laughs> right. a second source. Can, can you but explain also, what a second source is, Kendra, for people? Uh, you, want, you want the reporter to have asked another researcher in that field, unaffiliated with the study, their opinion on the study. Um, but I also, I just want to also point out something Peter said, which is I don't, just because it's in the New York Times does not make it true. Uh, the or quality, <laughs> or yeah, the quality of the editing and the reporting varies from the reporter and the editor on that desk. And so there's within any publication, there's a large range of quality within it. And so, you know, maybe over time, if you start looking at names, you will begin to trust a, a specific reporter or a specific vertical within a publication. But don't just need your trust the publication because it's had a long storied history. Um, because journalism in general is really bad about correcting the record. So a long storied history just means that they didn't get caught or people forgot that they were really problematic in the past. Oh, so you got any advice? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was gonna say if, if, it's a, if it's a story that is something that is sort of really big and controversial and you care about and it's really worth it to you to know what's true, I, I always read a couple different different sources um, so that I'm not leaning more on the bias of one or another. Um, I think in the introduction, uh, David mentioned that I'd spent seven years reporting in China and I'm still very interested in, um, you know, what, what's happening there. And so if there's a report about maybe, you know, the, the, uh, the, the peak the time of like peak carbon emission that they are promising has changed, you know, and I see like a headline that sort of suggests that in one outlet, then I'll like quickly sort of look at what other outlets are saying and oh no, wait, maybe that's something that appeared in a white paper, but wasn't an official, you know, official government proclamation. Um, because I think that that you know, it's just like if there's any really important decision, you, you, you sort of see if people's, if, if there's a coalescing of wisdom around something. Um, I mean, I guess that's the best advice that I could give. If it's something that is sort of frivolous, like best dog shampoo that you're not going to invest that time in, then I guess I would say, you know, try to develop a couple um, writers or, or um, you know, sources that you trust and, and have them be your go-to, where you've in effect done a little bit of digging beforehand to see if, if, they, if, if this is a trustworthy source of information or reporter. Um, yeah. I've got one more tip to, to Peter's question. Um, so it, if, if the story doesn't attribute its information, I mean, I'm still shocked by how many off the mainstream publications don't attribute their, their information. It's just shocking to me. And, but most readers don't spot that, that there's a lack of attribution. Or if they attribute it to another publication, which means they didn't do their own reporting <laughs> on the story. And if, it's, and if it's a platform you've never heard of, go look at the about page before you start to sink your teeth into a story. Yeah, I think that's great. Those are all really good answers. But I, I, you know, as a scientist myself, I find myself trying to convince people that what I do is credible. I mean, I, I study birds, so I, I get it to some degree. But I, <laughs> I also find that um, in general, there's a mistrust of science as being a credible industry or something that's really important. And I kind of think that we've done this to ourselves in many respects because we've People aren't used to dealing in variance and uncertainty. And, and I think that this, this information has been presented in, in weird ways, especially when you look at like things like the diet industry and how the diet industry goes back and forth and back and forth with various issues. And so when you're not trained in science, and frankly, you know, my kids didn't get science until they got into middle school. So we're not training children in science. And we're not teaching people how to think in a critical manner as a scientist. 
it, it gets it gets tricky. So it's no surprise that 50% of our population in the United States doesn't really understand how to digest science literature or science even in the news. And so I think we're in a bit of a predicament here. Uh, and um, I don't know what to do about that. I mean, right, I think, and I think so. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Kendra. Oh, I just can say, I think a lot of it is that part of the problem is the thing that gets cut from so many stories is the context, right? Like I did a, sorry, I, I did a story on chili peppers and like whether or not chili peppers are a superfood. And what it essentially was, it was about a study where a researcher, I think in Vermont, found that there might be a correlation between eating more hot peppers and better cardiovascular health. And what the story was essentially was it was a takedown of the whole concept of superfoods. And what we did was we talked about sort of the nature of the stu study and why the study would be important and it isn't to tell you whether or not you need to eat a chili pepper. It's to figure out if you can turn capsaicin into a drug or like the compounds in a chili pepper into a drug that might benefit um, you know, heart disease, right? Like that is the long-term goal of that. And so like telling the readers that and also sort of contextualizing it for it and being like, you know what, but chili peppers actually are good for you because they're a vegetable. Um, I know they're a fruit, sorry, but they're a vegetable in the way that we think of them. So if you enjoy eating them, they actually are just like objectively good for you because we know fruits and vegetables are good for you. And so doing more of that work uh, and thinking of journalism to a certain degree also is just pure education, I think is really important, but I think that's kind of gotten lost in recent years. We have a question asking about um, how do your newsrooms or, or in your own work, how do you screen for explicit or implicit bias? Um, and I'll just chat briefly uh, about, about I, first of all, I would just, the short answer is it's really hard. Um, uh, explicit bias is a little easier, and that is uh, partly what the editing system in most publications is designed to try to tamp down. Um, so you have, at my publication, we have the reporter, and at least two editors look at every story. So you have a, some diversity of viewpoints and experience looking over stories, and things are often caught that are, um, you know, maybe not bias, but there's selection of quotes, things like that. Um, you know, so implicit bias is much more difficult, particularly, I would say, in science journalism, maybe less so in environmental journalism. But in both cases, I think you have folks who have been drawn into these fields because they're interested and they're kind of fans, right? I mean, you know, they think what scientists do is important. They think the environment is important and stewardship is important. So there is some implicit bias there and, and that can be um, difficult to attack in some ways. One way to attack it that many publications have taken, including my own, is to really be intentional about diversity of sourcing. In other words, to, to not just go back to the same 60 year old white guys over and over again. Um, and to, you know, make, to, to try to make a real effort to have various kinds of diversity, uh, socioeconomic, gender, uh, ethnicity, race, the, what you name it, um, because my publication, we cover international science, so um, we're all over the place. Um, so those are some of the things that, that we try to do. Do you guys have other thoughts about explicit and implicit bias? I think the other thing is that we often think of it as what crops up in the act of reporting. So we've like now decided that we're going to do this story and we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And, but often it, where it shows up first is um, what you choose to report on in the first place, right? Like what stories that you cover. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think one of the ways to overcome that is you just need to be a really voracious reader, not just in science, but also outside of it. Because one of the things that ultimately a journalist is deciding is what's important, right? And the way that you know what's important is you have to have a wide scope of knowledge of sort of things, of the planet, of people, of um, what impacts people's lives, because that's how you start to realize like, wait, this is actually a really big deal, um, where you might not realize it because, you know, you know, like, um, I, uh, you know, I live in, I'm living in the Northeast, I'm from New York, and like wildfire is just not a really, it's much of a big deal over here, right? So like my implicit bias, like my inner bias, you know, is probably to think, oh, wildfires, who cares, right? I mean, obviously in recent years that shifted, but those are the kinds of things where either having a geographic diversity in your newsroom, but also just like being well-versed in other places and knowing things about other places and other people and other ways of being, is just really important. David, I, I would say that uh, two things. When I finish writing a story, I take a deep breath, go get a cup of coffee, and I read it with a 
utterly open mind because uh, that implicit bias is there. It is so important that we do everything we can to catch it. The other tool in, uh, is a lawyer. Uh, you know, investigative reporting is a big project and it can destroy lives and it can destroy careers. And I love having a lawyer review my work um, and that, that I that holds me to a very, very high standard. Make sure- I've lawyer. had so many stories lawyered now, I feel like I should go become a lawyer, First Amendment yeah. lawyer. <laughs> I, know, I know the feeling, right, right. But it's, <laughs> but it's a good thing, it's a good well, thing. Well, and you learn what little minor phrase can get you in real trouble. That's Christina, good. any last thought on that? Uh, I mean, I think you guys covered it. I think it's, I mean, I, 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 I although my path was not 100% intentional, I'm really glad to have worked in a very different context in China, I mean, it's different contexts politically, but also in terms of the intersection of politics and science. Um, and yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you, I think you guys have really said the important things. Well, listen, we are coming to, to the end of our time. Um, I really wanna thank uh, our panelists, Jeff, Kendra, Christina, extremely thoughtful conversation, uh, very deep. Uh, on some of these issues. I would remind the audience, you are seeing some of the best of the best. You really are seeing, as Pete said here, people who think very intentionally and very seriously about what they do for a living. And hopefully the business model will hold up long enough that they can continue to do it for, for a living. Um, we asked I think ethical journalists to join us, but they just didn't want to join us this time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thank each of you very much, and I turn it back to Pete. Yeah, I just want to follow up with a, with a e equally strong thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to speak to us about this really important issue. Um, and thank you again. I look forward to reading or seeing or hearing things from you in the future. Um, I also want to just to give a quick pitch for the next series of events that we have coming up uh, tomorrow at noon uh, with Nathan Hensley. Uh, he'll be interviewing Robert McFarlane, A Literacy of the Land, A Conversation, and that's from 12 o'clock to 1.30. And then if you Thursday, haven't read Robert McFarland, you should. <laughs> yeah, totally. Looking forward to that event. And then Thursday from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., we hear you, Earth Day Roundtable Discussion, inspired by conversations with Greta Thunberg. This is a youth climate artist and activist conversation. You know, how activism happens from the youth's perspective. And then Monday uh, with Nicoletta Perdu, another professor from, from Georgetown, writing climate change, a roundtable with several guest, guest speakers, Min Young Song, Ursula Heiss, and Sukanya Banner, Banerjee. So please join in on those events and thank you again for joining us this evening. Have a thank great you. Earth Week. Bye-bye. <laughs>